Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm going to discuss some of the technologies involved in biomanufacturing meat and the new harvest project that's being funded at Kent State University to drive cultured meat innovation. Meat biomanufacturing exists through the merging of multiple science disciplines, including biology, mechanical and chemical engineering, and computer science. At the interfaces of these disciplines, we've developed essential tools that will become central to the cultured meat industry, including cell and tissue culture, artificial intelligence, automation, and bioinformatics. Through utilizing these tools, we'll be able to scale up the manufacturing of proteins, cell culture media components, cells, and tissues, as well as improve the design and operations of bioprinters and bioreactors. Cultured meat products will likely roll out in a few phases, and each phase will have its own unique manufacturing challenges. Successive product phases will face an increasingly com complex biomanufacturing workflow. Phase one products will likely be animal cells being used as food additives in pre-existing plant-based protein products. While phase two products will be pure animal cell products that lack plant-based plant -based protein filler. The phase one and the phase two products will be unstructured, meaning they will not be synthesized into uh, three-dimensional tissue. And the, the goal of the phase three products will be tissue engineered products. This is a summary of uh, the overview of the biomanufacturing workflow to create manufactured tissue products. We start with cell manufacturing. In the cell manufacturing step, we can scale up the production of edible cells, but also cells that can produce proteins for bioinks or cell culture media components. The cells and their products used in the cell manufacturing step can then be used to biofabricate tissues. And this is a step where three-dimensional muscle tissue is synthesized through bioprinting. The bioprinted tissue can then be matured in the tissue manufacturing step in a maturation bioreactor, which is similar to a life support system for transplanted organs. And the tissue manufacturing step is the main focus of my presentation today. We begin with cell manufacturing. First, the cells are isolated from animals, and which cells are isolated are dependent on the manufacturing technique. You then develop your master cell lines, which will be scaled up in bioreactors. And the master cell lines must be capable of producing infinite amounts of animal muscle biomass. You do this by immortalizing your master cell lines, and this can be achieved through a few different methods, such as a reprogramming method, where you take a cell, reprogram it to a pluripotent state, and then differentiate it into multiple cell types. You can also directly immortalize cells that are isolated from an animal, such as skeletal muscle cells. And as we heard earlier today, there is another possibility of using embryonic stem cells to produce cultured meat. These cell lines are expanded in a bioreactor. In the reprogramming strategy, you can take a cell, such as a fibroblast, and induce it to be pluripotent. And if you want to grow a three-dimensional tissue, you need more than one cell type besides skeletal muscle cells in that tissue. So you can differentiate this iPSC to a skeletal muscle cell to produce muscle fibers, to endothelial cells to create vasculature within the tissue, and to adipocytes, which form the marbling of skeletal muscle. In either the reprogramming method, the uh, embryonic stem cell method, or the direct immortalization method, you have to create functional tissue from the cells that you grow. And in the case of muscle cells, this is called myogenesis. You begin with a satellite cell or a muscle stem cell that is activated to proliferate and then commit to differentiation. These cells fuse and become multinucleated muscle fibers. If you want to engineer vasculature within the tissue, you begin with a process called vasculogenesis, where endothelial cells coalesce to form a, an immature vascular network. 
This network is transient, however, and it's not stable, so it will disintegrate within 12 hours of its formation. To counter this, you have to stabilize it with mural cells. Mural cells are cells that are already found in the, uh, the blood vessel tissue niche, such as smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts, or mesenchymal stem cells. Once you add these mural cells, you can stabilize your vascular system with a, a venous side and arterial side for cell culture media perfusion. And finally, to marble the meat, you use a process called adipogenesis. Adipogenesis begins when a fibroblast or a mesenchymal stem cell is differentiated into a pre-adipocyte. This pre-adipocyte can undergo hyperplasia, meaning it makes more of itself, or hypertrophy, where it produces uh, fat droplets within the cell membrane. And then together, this maturation leads us to adipocytes, which are the cell type in fat, intramuscular fat. The cells produced in the cell manufacturing stage then can be used in the tissue biofabrication stage. In vivo, you have a tissue structure that contains not only skeletal muscle cells, but also blood vessels and intramuscular fat. So if you want to recapitulate the, this kind of tissue in uh, a manufacturing environment, you have to first model the tissue in order to define the placement of the cells and different tissue elements. So you do this through tissue modeling. You essentially create a three-dimensional structure in a modeling software the same way that you do with a maker bot or an ultimaker, and then you define where you're going to place these specific cell types. After your tissue modeling step, you form your bioink. And bioink is uh, the printable material that contains cells, uh, ECM proteins that form the scaffolding of the tissue, and cross-linking agents that can polymerize the scaffold together. You then use your bioinks to bioprint, and there's different kinds of bioprinting available. The first is what most people are probably familiar with, an extrusion-based printing system, which is what the maker bot uses. You extrude your bioink through a nozzle, and the bioink contains cells and extracellular matrix components, monomers, that are polymerized with cross-linking agents. And these can be enzymes, or they could be due to pH changes. And through the chemical reaction, you then uh, polymerize your scaffold with the cells embedded inside. There's another form of bioprinting called stereolithography, which has uh, recently seen more interest, especially with organ bioprinting. You don't necessarily have to bioprint the, the uh, bioink, but you have a different kind of bioink with stereolithography than with extrusion-based bioprinting. You use a different set of extracellular matrix molecules and cross-linkers. In the case of stereolithography, your cross-linkers are called photo-initiators, and they're stimulated to react with the extracellular matrix with light. So when you shine a specific wavelength of light onto the bioink, the photoinitiators bind the extracellular matrix together. And this is a very interesting form of bioprinting because it means that you can essentially uh, laser write in structures with very high definition and precision. Likely what we'll see in the future is a combined approach using both extrusion-based and stereolithography bioprinting, where you extrude your bioink but then also use light to write in specific structures. The bioink in this case contains cells, but also extracellular matrix molecules that can react with enzymes, pH changes, and also the photoinitiators that can be stimulated with light. And then in this case, you can place specific cells and specific tissue patterns in various locations according to your tissue model, and then go back in with your laser writing approach and define highly precise structures with stereolithography. The bioprinted tissue is then matured in a uh, maturation bioreactor in the tissue manufacturing step. So the tissues require a very specific kind of culture protocol. In the beginning, the tissues may require a different media formulation to promote different functions within the tissue, and then you can shift later to a different kind of media formulation that will promote differentiation. Additionally, the tissues will need to be uh, exercised and perfused with cell culture media, and once these tissues are ready and mature, they undergo downstream processing. 
In the case of this bioreactor, in your body, your muscles undergo stretch, and they're also stimulated with electricity from your nervous system. So you can build tissue platforms that allow for the stretch of the muscle, as well as electrical stimulation to induce hypertrophy and development of the muscle fibers. Additionally, if you have blood vessels incorporated into your tissue, you can integrate them with a perfusion system in the bioreactor. The bioreactor in this case essentially is an artificial heart that can pump artificial blood through the vasculature of the tissues. This will deliver hormones, oxygen, nutrients, growth factors, and trace elements into the tissue, as well as remove carbon dioxide and metabolic wastes. And this uh, tissue bioprinting strategy and the maturation bioreactor project has been the goal of my New Harvest research. But before I became affiliated with New Harvest, I was in the regenerative medicine field and got my start with a skeletal muscle tissue engineering project. And as Aaron alluded to, I just recently published a paper last week. The title is 3D Skeletal Muscle Fascicle Engineering is Improved with TGF Beta Treatment of Myogenic Cells and Their Co-Culture with Myofibroblasts. In this paper, we wanted to compare 2D culture systems with 3D culture systems when it comes to skeletal muscle development and see if there were differences between the two systems. We also wanted to look at the role of transforming growth factor beta, which plays a role of uh, muscle regeneration in vivo. And traditionally, people have used fibroblasts to improve skeletal muscle tissue engineering outcomes, but we also wanted to look at myofibroblasts because myofibroblasts are an activated form of fibroblasts that are the wound healing type and facilitate muscle regeneration in the body. So first we started with 2D cultures of fibroblasts and myofibroblasts. We stained the cultures for alpha smooth muscle lactin. We found more in the myofibroblasts. Myofibroblasts express more smooth muscle lactin because it is a more highly contractile form of actin. So when you have a cut or an injury on your body, your wounds actually contract closed because of your myofibroblast activity. Additionally, myofibroblasts are the scar producing cell. So we found that in these stains for collagen, they produce much more collagen than their fibroblast counterparts. We then wanted to look at the 2D cultures of myogenic cells called C2C12s and look at their outcomes in myogenesis. In our control condition, we found that there was a lot of myogenesis with, with myosin heavy chain expression. However, when we treated the cells with TGF beta, that decreased the amount of myogenesis in our samples. And then when we co cultured myoblasts and myofibroblasts with TGF beta, we saw zero muscle fiber formation. And this is in complete contrast to our 3D cultures. These are our tissue engineered samples of myoblasts that had no TGF beta treatment, but myoblasts here were treated with TGF beta. In the TGF beta treated condition, we saw more myogenesis and more alignment of the muscle fibers, which is a reversal of the uh, observation that we found in 2D cultures. We then combined our myoblasts with myofibroblasts and treated them with TGF beta. And we found in 3D the most robust muscle fiber formation out of any group. We can see these elongated and multinucleated muscle fibers with alpha smooth muscle lactin expression. And then the myosin heavy chain expression is also shown here with some high magnification images of what the myotubes looked like. So clearly with the 3D condition of myofibroblasts, myoblasts, and TGF beta 1, that is in complete contrast to the results that we saw in 2D, which is pretty interesting because in literature, it's been shown that TGF beta treatment with myogenic cells inhibits myogenesis. But are we using the right culture system to study TGF beta? Perhaps we should be taking our studies to 3D models. With these tissue engineered samples, we were using the same tissue engineering technique that Mark Post used to create his burger in 2013. So we wanted to translate our tissue engineering uh, technique to another platform. So we embedded ourselves in, or embedded ourselves in collagen one-based hydrogels. 
Here is our control group of skeletal muscle cells with no TGF-beta treatment. We can see here with TGF-beta, you see more muscle fibers forming. And then when you co-culture that with myofibroblasts, myoblasts, and TGF-beta, we see the best outcome in myogenesis. And this was very interesting because we actually observed this at the level of the hydrogels that we could see with our eyes. So these are the hydrogels that were in the six well plates. This is our group down here that contained myoblasts, myofibroblasts, and TGF-beta. It was the most highly contracted hydrogel out of any of the other conditions. This is our control sample here. So Clearly, the transmission of uh, tensional forces of the muscle fibers through the hydrogel contracted the hydrogel. And this is essentially the basis of the work that I'm now doing with the New Harvest Project. So the New Harvest Project is devoted to trying to engineer three-dimensional tissue samples from various species. And our main project is porcine and, and pork products. We've isolated and cultured skeletal muscle cells, endothelial cells, which here you can see are forming a, uh, uh, an immature vascular network that is not stabilized by mural cells, but also fibroblasts and myofibroblasts. And we would like to combine all of these together into a bioprinted uh, piece of bacon. We've also been looking at uh, bovine cells. Um, so we isolated some endothelial cells from uh, bovine sources and uh, earlier this week, we did a bovine cell isolation for skeletal muscle cells. So my undergrad is babysitting those cells in Ohio right now, and we'll know next week if we actually have some skeletal muscle cells. So that will be very exciting if we do I successfully have them. And then with the help of Paul Mozdiak at NC State University, we've been culturing skeletal muscle cells from turkeys as well. But without a perfusion bioreactor, we can't scale up the size of the tissues that we grow. So uh, we've been working on developing a cultured meat perfusion bioreactor of my design. And we first outsourced the construction of it, Bioreactor 1.0, to an undergraduate group at the University of British Columbia. And they have our, our finished project here. Uh, we've also started working with a second group for Bioreactor 2.0 in collaboration with IRNAS. Uh, that has been funded with the Shuttleworth Foundation. This is going to be an open bioreactor, uh, open source bioreactor that will be available for others to use, for others to make themselves or possibly purchase if they would like to use it for their experiments. So this bioreactor is going to be completed by the end of the summer and will be used in experiments at Kent State. So thank you for your time today. Um, I hope you enjoyed my presentation. We are looking for collaborators to work with us on the science, so if anyone is interested in any of the work that we're doing, I would be happy to discuss this with you later. And if you're interested in downloading the paper I just published, it's a pinned tweet on my Twitter account. Thank you.